Welcome to the RPC Church Podcast. We are so excited for you to listen along and hear this week's message. We pray that it inspires and motivates you and draws you closer to Jesus. Now, let's take a listen. Well, this morning we're continuing our teaching series, which is titled, Searching for Truth. Biblical perspective on today's hot button issues. In today's rapidly changing world, the lines between right and wrong often blur, leaving many of us searching for clarity and truth. And as Christians, we find our moral compass and worldview anchored in the teachings of the Bible. Sometimes when we talk about some of these hot button issues, they can be uncomfortable conversations. They might make us a little bit uncomfortable. You might, you might be concerned now that your pastor can see you so well with these new ceiling lights as we talk about some of these uncomfortable issues. Uh, I, I've, I've shared with you before that before I was a pastor, I worked lots and lots of jobs. Just over the course of my years of study, I would do lots of different part-time jobs, this, you know, uh, piecemeal work, that sort of thing. And so one of, the, one of the jobs that I used to work was I worked at Moore's Clothing as a, a sales associate. And they taught us some interesting sales tactics there. I'm giving you a little insider knowledge now, okay? And so what they said was that uh, if you can get a man talking you can get him to spend money. That was, that was the conversation, okay? And they said, uh, just keep them talking. It's kind of like in the old days when, when people used to sell things over the phone or door to door, same kind of tactic. As long as the person's on the call, that you, you can get them to buy something. Or as long as the, the person's front door is open for the door to door salesman, the, the sales pitch is still open. It's that kind of philosophy. And so they said to us, just keep them talking. Just keep the customer talking. Whatever you need to do in, you know, in, in the process of getting to closing the sale, just keep them talking. And they said, you can talk about anything. Whatever, whatever is interesting to that person, that customer, just, just talk about anything you want to keep them talking. You can talk about anything except never talk about religion or politics. Talk about anything you want, but never talk about religion or politics. Now, you've probably heard that before, right? You've, you've probably heard that in common parlance, we tell people, just don't talk about religion and politics. Has anyone ever heard that before? So in terms of uh, small talk, in terms of keeping people somewhat comfortable in small talk, not talking about religion and politics might be an effective strategy in keeping people engaged in small talk. What it has resulted in, however is a culture and a society that generally doesn't know how to talk about religion and politics. We're not well versed in conversations surrounding religion and politics. Now, I, I'm generalizing because I know that, that few of you here fall into that category. All of you know exactly how to talk about those things. But just joking aside, uh, I, I'm not here, uh, this is not my stump speech either. I'm not going to talk about politics today. I'm not campaigning here today, okay? But... Uh, as we talk about some of these hot button issues, the temptation might be to think, oh, this is, this is political, this is politicized. I, I'm not here to advance party politics of any party. What we're, what we're here to talk about is what does the Bible have to say? And so rather than us viewing this as being something that's political or politicized, we, what we have to understand is that the Bible has a lot to say about a lot of the issues that our culture is facing today. And, and if you didn't realize it yet, there is a cultural problem. Did, did you realize that? That there's a cultural problem going on today? I mean, there are many problems, right? But generally, there is a cultural problem. Um, it's, it's very, very problematic, the things that we're facing in our world today. And so as God's people, as his kingdom covenant people, we have to be knowledgeable about what's going on in our world, and we have to understand what is the biblical approach to these issues. Now, this is not opinion. I'm not talking about, this is, this is what Pastor Aaron thinks. This is, you know, Pastor Aaron's preference. What I'm talking about is what does the Bible actually have to say about these issues? And so this summer, Richmond Pentecostal Church, together we are going to have compelling and thought-provoking conversations about these issues in this sermon series titled Searching for Truth. Together we'll delve into the most pressing and controversial topics of our time, exploring what the scriptures have to say about morality, holy living, and a Christ-centered worldview. And so for those who were with us last week, you heard this introduction, but what I want us to think about throughout this series is, again, getting away from this being political. What does the Bible say? 
How do we have a biblical worldview? How do we get back to having a biblical worldview as God's people? And the second part is, in addition to having a biblical worldview, how do we restore our understanding of the holiness of God? Because I think, church, again, again, with the, the cultural problem that's going on out there, our tendency, and, and I'm, I'm guilty of this too, our tendency has been at times to allow the cultural voice to take priority over what the Bible says. The cultural voice is loud, right? What's the, the volume is dialed way up out there. And so our tendency at times has been to, to listen to the cultural voice more than what we've listened to what God is saying through scripture. So we've got to turn that around. We've got to get back to how do we have a biblical worldview? How do we understand the holiness of God? And if we could just have a glimpse of how, and, and, and an understanding, I think we have a glimpse because he makes it very clear through scripture. It's not as though God's not communicating it, it's whether or not we're receiving it. Have a picture of the holiness of God and how holy God is and what a holy God requires of his people. Because if we had a reverence for the holiness of God, then all of these issues, I believe, would, would come into line in our hearts and in our understanding. Now, I said this last week, I'll say it again. There's a lot more to it than that, but there certainly isn't less to it than that. And so while we might want to complicate things, if we could simplify it down to having a biblical worldview and understanding the holiness of God, I believe that we'll be able to get many of these things straight. Last week, we talked about the sanctity of life and emphasized how important it is that we uphold the sanctity of life from natural conception, from, from conception to natural death. We're talking about the sanctity of life from conception to natural death and everything in between and how we prioritize and uphold the sanctity of life. And there have been some great conversations that I've had even in the days since we, we started this series last week. Uh, there have been conversations, questions about resources, materials, and, and those sorts of things. And so if you did want more resources pertaining to upholding the sanctity of life, um, you can always revisit the, the message that we shared last week. It's still on YouTube. To my knowledge, it hasn't been taken down yet. And if there are additional resources that you like, you can always email us, info at rpcchurch.ca, and we'd be happy to share with you some additional resources. So throughout this series, from the sanctity of life and human sexuality to money management and other subjects, we'll confront these issues head on, guided by the wisdom of God's word. As we uh, open up our, our conversation today, and we're going to be talking about it in a few moments with this subject today and other subjects. We may not cover every detail to the extent that you would like us to, but what we'll do is our best to give a, a broad overview and, and then point you in the right direction for further study on these subjects. Our goal is not only to understand the biblical world, worldview on these matters, but also to equip ourselves to engage in meaningful and compassionate conversations with those around us. I want to emphasize that peace, the compassionate conversations. Jesus taught us to love one another. He taught us to love those who are different from us. And so what we're, what we're not trying to do here is to furnish ourselves with anything that can be weaponized to hurt somebody. This is, this is something that's intended for us to understand what we believe, what scripture teaches us, as well as to give us the tools to have compassionate conversations, to show love in our conversations with those around us. And so through this series, we aim to strengthen our faith, uphold the truth, and extend Christ's love to a world in need. Whether you are grappling with these questions yourself or seeking ways to support others, our hope is that this series would enlight be enlightening and transformative. And indeed, these are the issues of our time. But what is it that we should do? What is the biblical Christian position on these matters? And so today we're talking about money. Money. It's a topic that can stir up a variety of emotions and reactions. Money is something that's all around us. You can't avoid it. I know that recently there have uh, been movements such as the, the Buy Nothing movement, where uh, many are hoping to move to a post-money society, post-currency culture. Uh, I think that's probably a long ways away. I don't think that there's any way that we can avoid money in our in our day-to-day -day lives, but we are surrounded by it in terms of what we hear about in the news, its influence in politics. We experience its impact in our personal lives. 
And, and with money being as prevalent as it is, at least in terms of its, its, uh, its focus that it, that it receives, it's amazing what money can do to our hearts and lives. For some, the pursuit of wealth can lead to ethical compromises, while for others, it could be a source of anxiety and stress. Now, you might say to me today, okay, Pastor Aaron, you said that this is a sermon series about hot button issues. Money is not controversial. You might say that to me. But I would say back to you, I would say this, money talks. And the, the way that money talks is that it reveals a lot about our characters. It reveals a lot about our values and our priorities. And so money talks. Money can uh, teach us about uh, our hobbies, our backgrounds, our histories. Our financial decisions can be even more telling. Show me your bank statements and I'll be able to tell you where your priorities are. I'm not actually asking you to show me your bank statements. But, but, but the, the thought is true. Where, where our bank statements indicate our, our money is allocated tells us a lot about our priorities where we spend our money. I didn't come up with this idea. This, again, is straight from Scripture. This idea is rooted in Scripture, where Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It serves as a powerful reminder that our spending reflects our true priorities. So what is the Christian approach to money? And what place should it have in our lives? How much of our money is ours, and how much is God's? That's a trick question, by the way. How much of our money is ours, and how much of it is God's? This morning, we'll explore what the Bible has to say about money. Now, again, this is not exhaustive, because there's lots of, lots of directions we can go with this, but we're talking about it in terms of our priorities and what it reveals about our hearts. So we'll explore what the money has to say about money. In particular, we, we will talk about the Lord's tithes and our offerings, and we'll see how these practices are not simply financial transactions. The Lord's tithes and our offerings are not simply financial transactions. They are reflections of where our hearts are. They're integral to our spiritual devotion. So I invite you now to turn with me to our main passage of Scripture, which we will look at, which is found in the book of Malachi. It's the final book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3, starting in verse 10. I have the passage also written up here on the screen. If you don't have a Bible at all, and you'd like one, we have Bibles in the, in the pew seat, either in front of you or behind you. And again, this is the, the final book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 3, starting in verse 10, where we read this. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be, not be room enough to store it. Passage goes on and says in verse 11, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Church, will you join me as we turn our hearts to the Lord in prayer? God, we come before you with our hearts open to your word. We ask that you would guide us as we seek to understand your teachings on money and giving. Help us to see beyond the material. Help us to grasp the spiritual significance of your tithes and our offerings. May your Holy Spirit move among us. Lord, where necessary, may you convict us and encourage us to live lives of generosity and faithfulness. We pray this in Jesus' name. And God's church said, amen. Amen. One of the most misquoted passages in all of scripture is about money. You've probably heard this saying before. Has anyone ever heard this? Money is the root of all evil. Anyone ever heard that phrase before? You've heard it, but that's not how the passage goes. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 actually says this. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And all the finance people in the room said? <laughs> it wasn't as eager as I expected it to be. That's good, though. That's good. Because the passage goes on to say this. 
Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Isn't that, isn't that true? Money actually has a use in God's kingdom. And so the, kind of the blanket statement of uh, money is the, the love of money or money, the saying goes, okay, the blanket, stay, the blanket saying that I just quoted, uh, money is the root of all evil, that misquotation of scripture is, is misguided because God redeems our money for his kingdom purposes, right? So there is a use for it and we're gonna talk about that today. Now some might say, I don't like hearing the pastor talk about money. You might even say, that's all that pastors talk about. Well, that's not exactly true. And, and, and so, you know, the, I, I, will, I will acknowledge that there have been times, we're all aware of them, that unfortunately, pastors and church leaders have abused these and other passages. That's, that's a reality. But money is not all that pastors talk about. And if money is all that the pastor talks about, then you should find another church. I don't talk about money very much, so you can stay at this church. But it's interesting, okay, so money is not all that pastors talk about, but it's interesting. The thing that Jesus talked most about was the kingdom. More than anything else, if you go through the Gospels, Jesus talks about the kingdom more than he talks about anything else. What's the second most common thing that Jesus talks about? It's money. Again, if you go through the Gospels, the second most frequent thing that Jesus talks about is money. I think there's a correlation there. In other words, the kingdom comes first, but our money needs to be surrendered to God's kingdom purposes because his, his intent is that our money would be used toward the advancement of his kingdom. He spoke about money, and so I think it's important that we also have the right approach to how we use our money. And I believe this, this also fits in with the other themes of this series because we need to get our attitude surrounding money right. Now, you've probably heard me share this before. I don't talk about money a whole lot. I, I might have one or two sermons a year where we talk about money. But I've used this quote before and I'll use it again because I think, I think it's a great quote. Billy Graham famously said that if a person gets their attitude towards money right, they'll get their attitude right towards most of the other issues that we face in life. If you get your attitude toward money right, you'll get your attitude toward most of the other issues that we face in life right as well. And, and, and having the right attitude about money is having it surrendered to God. In the final pages of the Old Testament, we find the book of Malachi. And it concludes with a powerful anticipation of the arrival of the Messiah, anticipation of the Lord's coming and of the one who will prepare, prepare his way. Malachi calls its original audience to get ready for this momentous event. Well, Jesus came in, in the form of a child as the Messiah. Church, we live as those Okay, we live in the age of the church now. We live as those who are in anticipation of the Lord's return. And so Jesus came the first time, but he's coming back to us again. We anticipate this. Our lives are oriented towards the Lord's return. And so this is a time for transformation. Scripture describes that the return of the Lord will be a day that will be like a refiner's fire. We anticipate the return of the Lord and, and allow this time of anticipation to be a time where our hearts are purified, where our desires are reshaped, where our priorities are renewed, reoriented towards kingdom, priority, kingdom priorities. We are allowing the Holy Spirit to renew our thoughts, to change our conversations, and to steer us away from selfishness and self-centeredness. Malachi calls us to return to the Lord. And especially calls us to return to the Lord when it comes to our giving. Now some who are well versed in this passage and, and on this subject of tithing, some will say that tithing is an Old Testament concept. And that's true. It is an Old Testament concept. In the New Testament, we're encouraged to give much more than a tithe. We're encouraged to give everything that we have. 
So while tithing is an Old Testament concept, the concept for us in the, in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, is that the tithe, is, is that's, that's the ground floor. That's the entrance level. We're actually called to much more generosity as those who are living in light of the New Covenant. And Malachi calls us to return to the Lord when it comes to our giving. Church, how we handle our money is a true reflection of our broader outlook on life. And so I want to talk to us about a few things. The first thing I want to talk to us about is this, money and community. Money and community. Jumping to the New Testament, in Acts chapter 2, verses 44 to 45, we read these words. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. In the early church, money and resources were not seen as personal property, but rather as communal assets, things that are to be used for the advancement of God's church in community. The believers shared everything they had, ensuring that no one among them was in need. Now, this kind of sounds like some sort of an ideal, and I think in a lot of respects it is an ideal. It's something that we should probably aspire toward, but it isn't something that was always simple, smooth, and straightforward, because if we were to read the the New Testament epistles, the letters of the Apostle Paul, we'll see in many instances that he was writing to churches where there was disparity between church members, some that that earned a lot, some that didn't earn a lot, and, and that there was at times... Uh, sort of uh, factions that were forming based on people's economic status. And so even in the early church, we're, we're, not, we're not trying to uh, paint a picture of the early church that says that they had this all figured out. I think from, from the very beginning, we've been wrestling as, as Christians, from the very beginning, we've been wrestling with our human nature, which is to prioritize our own needs above others' needs. But we still need to confront that nature because that's not what God wants for us. God wants for us to be as those who are his body, where, where we are equal, where the status is equal, and where we look out for the needs of others on a very, very practical level. Something that we, we prioritize as a church, and I want to share this with you, is that if you are facing need, material need, and, and money is in short supply, and that's a reality today that we're not insensitive to, I've spoken about this before. We're, we're well aware of the rising cost of living, especially in this part of the world, where it is very difficult at times just to put groceries on the table. And so we're not insensitive to that and certainly don't want to be dismissive of that. If you are finding yourself in need where, where food is in short supply, we do have a couple of ministries we would like to make available to you. We have our grocery hamper ministry where we're able to put grocery packages together and you can collect them. And we also have our bread ministry where we put uh, baked goods together and we're able to make those available for collection as well. And so if you are facing food scarcity, we want to be able to, to, to help you in that. Please come speak to us, phone us, send us an email, info at rpcchurch.ca, as we'd love to be able to support you. Because this is a fulfillment of what God's plan is for his church, that we exist in community. Uh, This is the reason, for instance, that next Sunday we're having our community potluck, our family potluck together. And uh, I know when that was announced, and Pastor Seth announced it, that there were some cheers from the congregation. So that's where, you know, you've got good priorities because you want to gather together and break bread together. This is something that we're doing as we seek to emulate what was the, the intent, the design, the vision for the early church, which was that we would be a community with one another. As we look at giving, but very practically giving to those in need, this is a radical form of generosity which created a strong sense of community and solidarity. It wasn't just about giving, it was about living out their faith in practical, tangible ways. Uh, Every so often, I, as, as a pastor, and privy to conversations where people are not trying to disclose this, they're not trying to make a big deal of it, but I periodically will become aware of times where there is generosity between believers in the church. And this is quite aside from from the church's finances, so this doesn't appear on the church's books, this is just from one person to another. Periodically I'll hear of radical generosity where someone in the church has given, whether it's money or material support or food to someone else in the church, and as a pastor that really warms my heart. Uh, because this is, this is, again, a fulfillment 
of this design that God has for his church, which is that there would be generosity between members, and, and, and no one's looking to publicize that, but when I become aware of it, it's something that's very, very encouraging to me. When we do talk about tithes and offerings, it's important for us again to remember this example. Our giving should be a reflection of our commitment to God's work and his work among us in his community. Around the world, and, and, and specifically now, church, I'm talking about parts of the developing world that are materially far less affluent than we are here in the West. Around the world, the church is thriving. In the West, where we are encountering this cultural problem, I think in, in many respects, the church has been intimidated. And I'm not pointing fingers when I say that, because uh, we're all part of this. I think in many respects, the church has been intimidated by the volume of the cultural voice. But if we look around the world, okay, outside of the West, as we look around the world, we see that, that the church is flourishing, that in the developing world, that the church is thriving. And, and as we even, over the course of these past several weeks and months, went on mission trips where I went to Nepal, Pastor Crystal went to Guatemala, uh, our, our student ministry team went to Yukon, but especially as we looked at the, the churches in the developing world, we saw that the churches there are flourishing, that the churches there are thriving. But what we've also seen is evidence of God's blessing in and through the fact that these churches, which are less affluent materially, right? In the developing world, in many instances, the churches are less affluent materially. Those churches are rich in faith and generosity. And if there is a need, the, uh, God's people aren't looking to governments to respond to that need, they're looking to the church to respond to that need. I think there's something beautiful about God's design in this. And, and I, have no, I have nothing against government agencies that provide aid to people in need. I have nothing against that. Uh, in, many, in many respects, those structures that exist in our governments in the West, where there is welfare, many, in many instances, those systems came about because of God's people, Christians, influencing the society through revival and otherwise uh, for, those, for those structures to be in place to provide welfare to those in need. So I have nothing against them. But I do think, church, that in, in many respects, as it relates to uh, people who are in material need, we've allowed ourselves as, as a church to relinquish that, that very practical act of aid to the government agencies and we've kind of abdicated ourselves of that responsibility as God's church. And so I'm not proposing that, that you know, church ministry should replace those agencies. What I am saying is that we've got our work cut out for us as we seek to gain back some of the things that we've relinquished as it relates to responding to the very practical needs that are out there. But it's right from scripture. And so not looking to, to governments, not looking to... Uh, welfare agencies to respond to needs all the time. I believe that as God's church, we, we really need to step in and, and fill that need and fill that gap and where there is need among us that we would be able to respond to that need. This is something where if a family in the church experiences a crisis or a need, the entire community rallies around them. They offer prayers and well wishes, yes, but they also give generously. Now, I'm saying all of this because it's from Scripture, but I also recognize that this is countercultural. And in fact, the kind of supporting spirit that, that's, that's called, that we're called to emulate here in Scripture, in many instances, goes against what the culture is telling us as to how we should spend and use our money. When the world says to put yourself and your own needs first, the countercultural current of the kingdom says to embrace a spirit of sacrificial love and communal support. Amen? Secondly, church, we see money and clarity. Now, when it comes to money matters, we want to have clarity. And so as you look to scripture, we get some clarity on that. Hebrews chapter four, verse 13 reads this. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Kind of a scary thought, isn't it? Nothing is secret to God. How we spend our time, how we spend our money, our thoughts, all of them are known to God and ultimately we're going to have to give an account for them. 
Transparency and honesty in how we handle money are crucial. It's easy to let financial matters become a source of secrecy and shame, especially if we're struggling with debt or with mismanagement. Now, I'm not, please understand me. I, I got to say this every time that we talk about this because I mean it. I am not seeking to shame anybody. Like we talked about last week, there is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So this is not about anybody uh, shaming anyone else. It's just the reality that sometimes we impose that shame on ourselves. And sometimes when it comes to things like money, we, we allow ourselves to become ashamed again, perhaps because of debt or because of financial mismanagement. So there's no shame here, okay? I'm, I'm trying to emphasize that. But the reality is that God sees everything. He sees everything and he calls us to live in the, that light. He calls uh, for us to allow everything to be exposed to the light bringing our financial dealings into the open, at least with God and, and with those whom we trust. Be very, very careful about those whom you trust with that information, by the way. But we are to be open in the sense that being open about our finances can prevent the love of money from taking root in our hearts. If we're transparent with the right people, again, transparent with God and, and with the right people about our finances that will allow us to prevent money from taking, uh, the love of money from taking root in our hearts and it can help us to avoid temptation. Now, you don't have to make your financial affairs known to everybody, okay? I'm not saying that. But your financial affairs should at least be known to you. Your financial affairs should not be a mystery to you. Part of being good stewards of God's resources is that we manage our money well. I'm not a financial advisor. I always have to make that very, very clear. And so I'm not giving financial advice. But if your money is a mystery to you, then it is important to find a good financial advisor. And if you'd like help with that, we can point you in the right direction. Again, I'm not here to offer financial advice, but we can at least point you in the right direction of those who can. Uh, and I also, I, I say this again, when it comes to financial transparency, I don't mean that you need to tell everyone about your money. You don't need to tell everybody about it. I mean that we are, uh, we, we, if we need help, we can get help. And if, if it's necessary, you know, so maybe you don't need help financially. Maybe, maybe you've got it all sorted out. The transparency piece is a matter of accountability where, again, you find somebody who is trustworthy, whom you trust, that you can be uh, held to account by, that you can be accountable to. And, and say to this person, look, am I, am I making money too much of a priority in my life? Am I showing evidence of loving money? And so you want to find a seasoned saint who's, who's able to identify that potential source of temptation in your life. It's just like anything else in our lives, could be money, could be anything else, that can be a source of temptation Sometimes we need a little bit of accountability from trusted people. Ultimately, we are going to have to give an account to God. And so the saying that I have often heard before is, do you want God to be the first person you ever give an account to? Or would you prefer that there are loving people in your life that, that give you some accountability before that day of day arrives so that we can be on the right track, knowing that ultimately we are accountable to God? Here at Richmond Pentecostal Church, we're very forthcoming with financial matters. And I don't mean that in terms of everybody when they greet each other, that they show, that they show each other their, their bank balances. That's not what I mean. That's your, that's your business. What I'm talking about is that as a church, okay, as an organization, we're very forthcoming with financial matters. Our financial reports are professionally reviewed by a nonpartisan accounting firm every year. And our financial report and budget are made publicly available at our annual general meeting. In fact, our financial report and our budget are both accepted every year by the membership of the church at the annual general meeting. We value transparency because we are called to accountability in these matters. As you join us today, if you wish to be involved in the decision-making process here at Richmond Pentecostal Church, be it our church budget or other matters, if you are not yet an official church member, allow me to take this opportunity to invite you to our membership class, which is taking place today. 
after church in the fireside room uh, where you can learn a little bit more about what official church membership entails. That might be something that you're interested in. And refreshments will be served. That might be a little added incentive for you. But if you do have, if you do have something to eat, you have to stay until the end of the meeting, okay? <laughs> so lastly, I want to talk about money and culture. And again, this is where money can be one of those hot button issues that, that we need to identify. Money and culture. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 reads this. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Money is not the root of all evil. Scripture says the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. And so as it relates to what we do with money, God uses our money. He uses it for his kingdom purposes. But we need to confront those areas where our attitudes toward money have been conformed to the patterns of this world. Our culture has many ideas about money. How to earn it, how to spend it, what it means for our identity and our success. Now, not all of that is bad. There's some great advice out there that uh, pertains to how we manage our money. So I'm not, I'm not trying to you know, blanket this, uh, paint this all as being bad. It's not all bad. Unfortunately, however, cultural norms can conflict with biblical teachings. And so those areas that are not transformed by the renewing of our hearts and minds as it pertains to the use of money, those are the areas that we really need to confront. Now, the world tells us to accumulate wealth. Well, that can be a good or a bad thing. So as, as I preach to you this morning, I, I don't want you to come away from this, this sermon and, and think to yourselves that Pastor Aaron is saying, do not save for your retirement. I'm not saying that, okay? It's good to invest and save for your retirement. And so that's wise. That's, that's good advice. But when it comes to accumulating wealth, we have to ask ourselves, what is the purpose for the accumulation of this wealth? Is it about my personal status? Is it, is it because a, a, a large bank account, a large bank statement makes me feel really, really good about myself? Or do I derive my worth from my financial status? The Bible calls us to a different standard, one of contentment, generosity, and trust in God's provision. But most of all, the Bible calls us to the standard of knowing that we are created in the image and likeness of God. We are his image bearers. And those who are in Christ, as you've received Christ into your life, you've been invited into the family of God. And your identity is now that you are a child of God. That is something that we get our sense of self-worth from. That is something that will fulfill us and satisfy us far more than, than any bank account or investment portfolio ever could. You are a child of God. And so as we are called to this different standard, we, we recognize that, again, this is countercultural. And that in many instances, this goes against what the world is telling us that we need or that we should do. The disparity between genuine needs and extravagant wants highlights a deeper issue in our culture and in our world. And that issue is greed. I came across a recent poll which asked people what they thought was the most prominent problem in North American culture. A poll asked those surveyed, what do you think is the most prominent problem in North American culture? And the majority of responses pointed to greed and materialism. It's interesting, right? That, you know, and, and you take this for what it's worth, take it with a grain of salt, because every, every poll is just that. It's a small sample of, of the society. But again, in those, of those surveyed, most of them, when they were asked, what is the most prominent problem in North American culture? They pointed to greed and materialism. Now, the poll went on and had a second question. So that was the question about the broader culture. What's the most prominent problem? They said greed and materialism. The second question of the poll asked these people about your personal struggles. What are your personal struggles? And of those surveyed, 
greed was listed last among them. So the, the culture's biggest problem, they thought, was greed, but they didn't perceive greed as being their personal problem. And this again reveals a disconnect where we recognize greed in society, but we fail to see it in ourselves. Uh, Timothy Keller is a well-known preacher. He went home to be with the Lord a few years ago. And he pointed out that while it's evident that the world is filled with greed and materialism, almost no one thinks that that applies to them. This self-deception is dangerous, which is why Jesus frequently addressed the topic of money. We must not shy away from discussing it, even in church, because it can lurk in all of our hearts, including mine. The saying we've come to associate with this pattern is the pressure to keep up with the Joneses, that old saying, keeping up with the Joneses. Even if we have a good job and a comfortable lifestyle, we might feel inclined to constantly compare ourselves to others, feeling inadequate and discontent. Alan Barnhart is a Christian businessman and CEO who decided early in his career to cap his personal income and give away the rest. He and his family lived on a modest salary, and they donated the profits of their multi-million dollar company to charitable causes. Very countercultural. This goes against what, what the culture would say. But Barnhart's decision was based on the belief that he was merely a steward of God's resources. By giving generously and seeking fairness with his employees, the Barnharts avoided the pitfalls of greed, and they used their wealth to bless others. Church, it isn't until we embrace the biblical principle of contentment and generosity that we find true peace and joy. And again, this is very countercultural. By focusing on what we could give rather than on what we lack, we experience a transformation in attitude towards money and material possessions. So I have a few points of application for us. And you can take out your phones and take pictures at this point if this is something that you want to think about, and I would encourage you to do so in the days ahead. First of all, examine your heart and motives. Reflect on why we give. And so, at the beginning of this gathering, we did something that we hadn't done in a long time. We had an opportunity, a moment in our gathering to give as an expression of worship. It's about much more than just the practicalities of passing the plate through the pews. The point is that our giving is an act of worship. And so that's a moment where we examine our motives. Okay, why am I giving? Why do I do this? Is this uh, something that I do merely out of obligation or is this something that's born out of generosity? And as Romans chapter 12 says, out of transformation. True giving flows from a heart transformed by God's grace. It's an act of worship, and accordingly, we give generously. Secondly, church, we cultivate a spirit of generosity. And this is something that that is a hallmark of God's church, and it's something that that I would love for it to be a part of the DNA of Richmond Pentecostal Church. We look for opportunities to bless others with our resources, be it through our regular tithes, our special offerings, or through helping those around us. Finally, church, we seek accountability and transparency. If you need to, find trusted friends or mentors with whom you can discuss your financial practices. Transparency can lead to greater wisdom and accountability in managing God's resources. Money can be a controversial and sensitive subject, but it doesn't have to be. And it's important for us to address this subject. The Bible provides clear guidance on how we should view and use our resources. So I asked a question, I don't know if you remembered it, but I asked a question at the beginning of this message, and I, I, said, I said this, our money, okay? How much of our money is God's, and how much of our money is ours? Do you remember when I asked that question? How much of our money is God's? How much of our money belongs to God? How much of our money belongs to us? Well, when it comes to the question of whose money is it, the reality, here we go, gold star award. The reality is that it's all God's already, isn't it? All of it is already his. And church, true value lies not in material wealth, but in our relationship with God and our generosity toward him and towards others. We must be very careful to guard against the allure of greed. 
by intentionally planning to give. Plan to give. When it comes to putting together your, your budget, and you should have one. If you don't have one, you should have one. And again, if that's something that you struggle with, I'm not a financial advisor, but we can help point you in the right direction. So in your budget, have a plan to give. It should be a line on your budget, giving. And, and, and it might even be multiple lines, because there are different, different causes that we give to. Plan to give. Not only through one-time offerings, but also through faithful tithing to support the work of the local church. In Malachi's time, the tithe was like a spiritual income tax used for the maintaining of the temple and supporting its staff. Now, we're not here to tax anybody. And again, this is where, if, if we want to talk to the Bible scholars, they'll parse this out and say tithing is an Old Testament concept, so Pastor Aaron, you shouldn't be talking about it. But what I'm talking about is this is not taxing. This is giving freely and giving generously and, and giving because we're returning to God that which is his already. We give to the church so that through the church we can advance the work of God's ministry and also can contribute to hospitality, helping the poor, offering free will gifts when, when, when the needs arise, giving to the advancement of God's mission around the world. We who are in Christ are required to give back to God that which is his out of obedience. And so we use the terminology of tithe because that's helpful. We give 10%, which is the, it's called the tithe. It's, it's one-tenth. Uh, we've, we've used this terminology, and I think it is helpful terminology, and, and you've probably even heard me say this throughout this message. We refer to it as God's tithe. So when you give, you're not giving your tithe, you're giving God's tithe. And then what you give in addition to that is your offering. So we give God's tithe. And again, this is, this is the, the entrance level. This is the ground floor. We're called to give God's tithe, but you are welcome to give even more than that if you so choose. I heard a story, you know, this is uh, something that, it, it was a story involving a politician. I'm not, I'm not gonna make this political. Told you I wasn't gonna make it political. But I heard a story involving a politician, and in this instance, it was in the United States. Typically, I like to include Canadian content, but this was in the US. And there was a politician, he was a senator, a United States senator, who had served a, a, a tenure as senator that uh, having passed a certain threshold of years serving as senator, he got a raise, he got a significant raise in his salary as senator, and he started earning several hundreds of thousands of dollars per year as a senator. And he was involved in a local church in Washington, D.C., and he was thinking about his raise and what that meant. And so he was, he was conflicted, and he was troubled by it. And so he, he called up the, the chaplain to the House of Representatives in the United States, and he said to the chaplain, he said, I'm, I'm earning this salary now. I'm earning several hundreds of thousands of dollars per year in this salary. And, and I know that the Bible calls us to tithe and calls me to tithe. But if I take this literally and I tithe, I'm going to have to give tens of thousands of dollars per year to the church. And he said to the chaplain, I, I just don't know that that sits well with me. Would you pray with me about this? Would you pray that, that God would allow me to give less through my tithe? Is there a way that I can give less through my tithe? And so the, senator, uh, the, the chaplain said to the senator, absolutely, I'd, I'd be very happy to pray with you about this. I'd be very, very happy to pray with you about God reducing your tithe. And the senator said, fantastic, let's pray. And so the chaplain said, okay, dear Lord, I pray that you would reduce this man's salary so that he doesn't have to tithe as much. <laughs> so the senator Senator Trudeform said, I'll give my full tithe. <laughs> but as we're called to giving and giving generously, it's all his anyway, isn't it? And, and you know, I know that's just a little joke, but it's a helpful one because if, if we're conflicted with this and we want to be less generous with God, then really what we're saying is that we want God to be less generous with us because it's all his anyway. As you give the Lord's tithe, this goes directly to the local church. It's separate from our offering and other causes, and, and it is something that is used to advance the Lord's ministry. There are several ways to give. And so this morning, we, we, 
uh, resumed giving physically, and, and you may wish to continue to do that, you can give through cash or check, and you can get a giving envelope. If you send us an email, we'll set you up with a giving envelope, uh, because this is a registered charity. We're a charitable organization here at RPC. We are able to issue a charitable income tax receipt for monies given uh, to our general fund. And so uh, if you wish to sign up for a giving envelope, we can set that up so that at the end of the financial year, we can give you a, uh, an income tax, a charitable donation income tax receipt for the purposes of your tax return. We can set that up. We'd be very happy to do that. Uh, you can give electronically. You can uh, give online. If you go to rpcchurch.ca slash give, you can give using your credit card. We have an e-transfer option where you can give simply by sending your e-transfers to contribute at rpcchurch.ca. This is a great option because there's no fee. It doesn't charge you a fee. It doesn't charge the church a fee. And so everything that you give, uh, there's no processing fee. It goes directly to advancing the Lord's work here at RPC. You can also set up your e-transfers so that you can give on, on a, a degree of frequency, a degree of regularity, and so that this is something you can do on a monthly basis just by, uh, just by assigning that to your e-transfer allocation. Uh, there, you can text to give. We have an option where you can text to give. There's no shortage of ways to give, and we want you to be aware of those things so that you are able to give as God leads you to do so. But I also, again, come back to this moment that we had together at the beginning of our gathering where we passed the plate around, which is even if you're not giving physically into the plate, it's a moment for us to pray as God's church for surrendering our finances to him, and allowing him to use those finances and to use them as a moment of worship. Scripture highlights just how crucial our giving is in God's eyes. And so we prioritize giving. As we prioritize giving, we have a plan to give. And like I said, we put a line in our budgets to give. I also am of the conviction that we give right away. Scripture talks about giving our first fruits, and so we don't wait until everything else is paid for and, and then give. We give right away. We make it part of our routine, part of our pattern. Now, there are differences of opinions on, on whether we tithe on our gross or our net. Um, I, I am of the conviction, okay, so I'm, kinda, I'm gonna go into personal opinion here. I know I said I wouldn't speak too much opinion, but I'll speak my personal opinion. I am of the conviction that we tithe on our gross, rather than on our net. I give, we give our 10% on the gross income before tax. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave that to you to discern and pray, pray that through and leave that to your discretion. My conviction is that we give on the gross of what we earn. As we prioritize giving, we do so in generosity because again, it belongs to God. Now, I didn't go through all of the permutations of what the Old, pa Old Testament passages have to say, but when it comes to giving our tithe to God, we give, uh, we give generously because it is his in the first place. The Old Testament even says that if we withhold the tithe, we're in essence robbing God. So we take that very seriously. But if we as a church community give with open hearts, we can expect God, as the passage says in verse 10, to throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that we will not have room enough for it. God blesses us with such abundance as we give. That's not necessarily our motive for giving. We're not giving just because of the, the, the return that we get, but the saying goes, and it's true, that you can't outgive God. And, and, and the passage says, test God in this. Try it. In other words, if you've never tithed before, and this is novel and it's a new concept, just try it. And as you try giving, just see that God will bless you. I think God has a sense of humor about this. And, you know, I'm, I've probably shared these stories with you before, but I have given, uh, like aside from the tithe, I've given an offering or I've given a gift where no sooner have I given that offering or that gift that somebody else gives to me. And I see that as, as the, the abundance of God, and it's sort of like God having a sense of humor. Like, you, you think you can give more than me? Just try. Just try it. And, and no sooner than I give something away, somebody gives something else to me. Um, and, and I would encourage you, do the same. Just try it. Try it out. 
Part of the blessing is material, but there are other blessings as well. There's a spiritual blessing that comes from this, right? Even as we look at our passage, I'm gonna just read this back quickly to you. It, it, it says this, in, again, in verse 11, I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is right, says the Lord Almighty. So maybe, maybe you, you do grow crops, but if you don't, you can interpret that in other ways, that there is a spiritual protection that's in place, that God's not going to allow these things to happen to you. And then says, then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Uh, church, we can't, we can't outgive God. And the blessing that he gives us as we give generously is far more than we could ever think or imagine. I believe this. I've seen firsthand how God blesses us when we give faithfully through our tithe, through his tithe, and through our offering. Amen? I'm going to invite the worship team to come on up as we prepare to conclude today. The Lord's tithe and our offerings are not merely financial obligations. It's not merely a transaction. It's an act of worship and of devotion. It's a reflection of our trust in God's provision and our commitment to his work. And so church, the invitation is this, that we would embrace this call to generosity. That we would trust in God's promise of abundant blessings. Church, let us give cheerfully. Let us strive to be a community that is marked by generosity, by clarity, and by a biblical worldview on money. And by doing so, we align our hearts with God's kingdom we ensure that our lives are not defined by what we have, but rather are defined by our love for God and others. Remember this, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So where's your treasure? Where do your priorities lie? What do you treasure the most? I don't know about you, church, but what I would like to treasure what I would like to be that greatest priority is, is that act of glorifying God. But being more concerned by what God thinks of me than what others think of me. To get a glimpse of the holiness of God. Thanks so much for joining us today. We hope you're drawn closer to Jesus and that his love, his spirit, and his life are filling you right now. If you'd like to know more info about who we are and what we're doing at RPC, please head over to rpcchurch.ca to find out more. And if you like the podcast, you can subscribe. You can share it with your friends and family. You can click the share button, take a screenshot, and share it on your social stories and tag us at RPC Church. And one more thing before you go. We just want to remind you that you are loved by Jesus. God bless you.